I think a shareholder activist is someone who uh, is looking at trying to improve a company from the outside uh, and perhaps getting on board, but they tend to have a shorter time horizon than a private equity uh, investor who would be going in uh, and taking the company private so they could take whatever amount of time they needed to try to fix the company, whereas an activist tends to do it in the public markets. I think uh, the horizon of long versus short is, uh, is a bit of an oversell a lot of times in the dialogue about activism, but the horizons tend to not be as different as everyone thinks. To me, the biggest difference is shareholder activists are people who take a stake, a smaller stake, average between 5 and 10%, sometimes smaller, sometimes larger, and they drive change from the outside, as David says, but the benefit accrues predominantly for the shareholders of the company because of the fact that on average more than 90% of the shares are held by other people. Versus the management bank people will tend to drive the value for themselves. They pay for it, but there's, that's a fundamental difference between the two of them. Although from the activist side, if the activist exit the investment a lot earlier than the other shareholders, it really depends what the result is. If the result gets the stock price up in the short term and then it goes down in the longer term, I don't know that that's beneficial. The same can happen where the activists can lose their shirt, exit, stock then goes up and you have a similar problem. So True, um, but of course for emerging bankers they, uh, they may be pocketing a lot of the money for themselves and that's what they're trying to do, which is fine, but there, there's a two sides to every story. That's right, and they're usually willing to take risks that others aren't willing to take. I'll let you go first on this one. Yeah, the concept of universal proxy cards is something that we're supportive of. I think a question that you have to think about is whether it should be mandated, whether it should be an option that companies have. My view is it's something that's beneficial. I know there are structural issues in terms of how to implement it, but it's something that's beneficial because it replicates what happens at a shareholder meeting. It gives the shareholders an opportunity to look at the candidates from a global perspective and choose who they like. So I don't know that there's a one-size-fits-all answer. I'm never a big fan of mandating anything, but I am in favor of giving that opportunity. And if I had a preference, I guess I would do that. And I think from my perspective, um, there are situations where it's beneficial to have a universal proxy card. There are situations where it would be beneficial not to. If you mandate it, I think that that ultimately will help the activist. Uh, but there, I can also make the case that there are certainly situations where had there been a universal proxy card, the outcome of a contest might very well have been different. It's interesting because I think there's a debate, and I don't know the answer to this, about who really gets benefited from that. At the beginning of the dialogue, people were saying the companies get benefited more than the activists, and I know, I don't know what the answer to that I've is. I've always taken the other side of that because even though uh, there are situations where companies have clearly been disadvantaged, I think that having the ability to control the proxy cards, especially when you know who the votes are and everything else, which you can't do with a universal card, is a, is a different story. Oh, absolutely. I just, I'm not clear on who gets the benefit of that, but it's definitely a different story. Absolutely. Well, my answer is they are covered by Schedule 13D. I guess the question really is whether there should be a reporting counting them equivalency to actual ownership of the shares. Um, on the 13D today, item 6 requires discovery and disclosure of derivatives. Uh, companies, of course, would like to know everything about economics. Companies have a preference to always try to get more information and put more roadblocks up. I'm not sure exactly what the requirement is and what the interest and why a company needs to know. If somebody is below that threshold, that 5% threshold in terms of voting power, why the economic exposure is something that the companies have to have mandated that they have knowledge of. And I guess it dep it, it's all what you are disclosing. It's not just the disclosure issue, it's the impact of the disclosure. And if you had to count the derivatives, some of which could have just economic impact, some of which could have split impacts, uh, you know, sh shorting a position and other things, which some activists will willingly disclose and others won't disclose, even though I would argue that a lot of that's mandated. Um, you know, it does impact what, what their interests are and their timing. And I think full disclosure of derivative ownership, if you are, you know, if, if you've accumulated a 5% economic interest of a company or 5% voting interest of a company, uh, is all relevant and should be disclosed to the market. I also think 5% is too high a level, but that's a different debate.
Right, but I, again, we can have a different view on that, but I think that if you're below 5% and you don't have that type of influence in terms of investment or voting control, I'm not sure why the economics are important. You know, we have rules, and I agree with you. If people are violating the rules, we have the rules, and they should be enforced. Uh, but to the extent that they're adhering to the rules, I'm not sure why economics is a threshold of knowledge, other than, of course, companies would like to know it, why it has to be I, I, I guess if it, if it was solely an economic interest and there was no voting interest at all, I could understand the argument for saying 13D might not be the right place to disclose it. It maybe it gets disclosed someplace else. Uh, on, not on as a regular basis or something of that nature, but it goes to you know who the actual beneficiaries of the corporation are. If you've separated voting from economics, that can have real impacts on how a, a, a company is governed or, or what approach the owners may take. I guess it also depends who you find to be the owners. I don't think that there is a dollar threshold. I think that it should spend, you know, an amount that it feels is appropriate in some circumstances. That sh number should be zero, um, especially because it's not just the cost of the dollars, it's the impact on the company. If a company's in a distressed situation uh, and it's going to use limited resources to fight in that situation just to fight, I'm not sure what the benefit to the shareholders the employees, the company itself is. But by the same token, I don't think there should be a dollar threshold. I mean, the um, shareholder is going to have a cost too, and they get to pick what that cost is and how much they're going to spend, and it's up to the company to, to do the same thing. But the board has uh, a, a duty to not waste assets of the company. Yeah, I actually agree with that. I think that the one size fits all, again, isn't the answer to this. Companies are entitled to look at a situation and make the determination what is appropriate to do. I think the question comes from this impression from the, the recent campaign at Procter & Gamble where reports say that uh, the company spent over $100 million in essentially fighting uh, a one-seat request not even to really replace anybody. And that's what's generating the question about what is, and everyone in this dialogue, what's the appropriate amount of money? Was that a good use of resources? Big company, obviously dollars matter based upon size, but is that really what the shareholders would be interested in at the end of the day? And you have to ask on the try-end side, they have said they spent over $25 million. And if you were an investor in a try-end fund and you're funding part of that, is that something that, you know, is that too much money to spend? now? You know, each side has their own choices, and I'm not sure it was money well spent on either side. But uh, I think you have to look at the particular situation. Yeah, and uh, you know, the, I guess the only slight difference, although they're similar, is that in the trying example, they have to answer to their investors very clearly. I understand companies answer to their shareholders, but there's a more direct tie from an investment fund having the investors call up and say, excuse me, you're spending my money and I'm not happy oh, about that. I, I also think, though, that, you know, Nelson would say he was spending a lot of his own money and therefore he was entitled to spend what he wanted to spend. Fair point. Do you want to start? Sure. I, I think the genesis of that question is some of the flavors of poison pills we've seen recently. And I'm interested in your response because I'm seeing a little bit of reversal interesting in your perspective, where the acting in concert language is a relatively recent phenomenon, the last year or so, I know that it has some predating as well, where you started seeing these provisions going in where under a strict reading of the provision, two shareholders that don't even talk to each other but have similar thoughts could be deemed in the judgment of the board to be acting in concert and trip the pill, because that's how broadly the language was drafted. I think the objection to those provisions and why there's been a lot of pushback uh, in the marketplace based upon this is you shouldn't be chilling shareholders from being able to talk to each other. There are rules in place already, there are group concepts, there are rules you have to live with already, but the point of a pill is not to chill shareholder communication. And that seemed to be going a step too far, whether you accept the legitimacy of pills or not, and courts have accepted them, don't go too far with that. I think um, I'm not in favor of very broadly worded pills that provide vagueness. Uh, and ambiguity, that doesn't help anybody. Uh, you know, maybe there's a tactical benefit. We don't do pills of that nature. Uh, and the pills that are out there, I think, frankly, have been poorly drafted and, and not well thought out. And 
you know, I would argue if I was in that situation that in fact, you know, was the board fully informed when it made its decision because the language was so vague, what, what were they really doing? Um, I think that in specific circumstances, probably not having to do with a proxy contest, uh, there might be a situation where you would have broader language. But again, I think clarity is important here because foot faults by either side are not helpful uh, for what you're trying to achieve. You want, you know, the part of the idea of the clarity of a pill is that you've got a specific limit. Whether you believe in pills or not, you know, you're asking somebody to stop it at some position. If you add a lot of vagueness to that, it's not effective and somebody can argue it's ambiguous and can go higher or somebody can argue that, you know, it's got a chilling impact and then yeah, the, the purpose of the pill is really going to be examined closely. And that's why I was curious what you were going to have to say because I know you don't do that and that's one of the reasons you're so respected because you, you take a position, you're firm on it, but you're thoughtful about it. My fear is that some of these things were thought out and not by you, but by other people who thought about it and the vagueness was appreciated, known about, and was advised that that was a good approach because what it did do is it made people get worried. I know from that side that people at least had to start thinking about this, what do we do? We were confident when we started seeing this. If need be, we'll run to court. There's no court that's gonna uphold this, but that interjected another step, another process, another cost that people didn't want to deal with. And as much as I appreciate what you said, I'm fearful that actually they thought about and it. And if they did think about it, you know, at some point, if that's the intention and the board fully understands that intention, it gets to a question of whether they breach their duty of care or not. Agreed. Frankly, I think it depends on the circumstance. If you're in the context of a tender offer, uh, the rules already exist to say that if, if there's a wolf pack uh, accumulation while somebody's contemplating a tender offer, the answer is yes. I think the difficulty is if there's a sharing of information such that somebody accumulates in that circumstance, um, they should be seen as part of the group in some one way or another. And today, the argument is they're all acting in parallel. In, in order for there to be, you know, an inside information argument, the information would have to be shared, which by def to me means they're not really acting in parallel, they're somewhat acting in, in concert. And you can argue what that means or not, but if that's the case, I think that there should be some type of regulatory limitation on that, because the larger the group that is, you know, formed in that situation, and I'm using group loosely, not in the 13D sense, because it doesn't necessarily pick that up, the, the lawyer, it has an impact on the stockholder base and it can have an impact on outcome. Is insider trading necessarily the right answer? Um, I think it, it sort of depends what people's goals are. If, if, if the answer is to you know, sell the stock immediately when the position is disclosed by the original buyer and get out uh, at that point in time, uh, I think perhaps that is a misuse of information. If the in intent is to actually stay in and ride it up uh, and, and work together with, you know, consciously or unconsciously with the person that's made the original accumulation, I would argue that uh, that's a different set of rules, but it's not really an insider trading issue, it's a disclosure issue because the group is larger than what might be publicly disclosed. Yeah, I, I tell you one thing I find about this whole conversation about wolf packs. I think it's more of a red herring than anything else. I'm not saying it doesn't exist out there, but as much as I keep hearing about it, in my practice, I don't think I've ever seen it. Uh, uh, maybe I don't know of everything, I'm sure I don't. But at the same point, I don't see the people I work with calling up other people and bringing them in. To David's point, there is a group concept already in 13D. I understand that's a potentially higher threshold. Uh, if people form a group, we have rules for that already. Um, and I think there's a lot of talk about these wolf packs and this impression that there are people jumping in and maybe in certain parts of the market there are and I'm just not seeing that. Uh, but I think it's a lot of noise about nothing and we have inside information rules which exist. I don't think we have to upend them. Uh, and I'm, we have 13D group issues which exist that police most of this. If there's a slight gap that I'm just not seeing, Okay, but I, I'm not seeing really the issue. I, I think there's a difference in what you mean by wolf pack. For example, I think some people call it the wolf pack mentality when somebody announces a stake or makes it publicly known that they're accumulating right. and other people pile in. 
and that's public information right. and you know people may have similar investment horizons may have different hor investment horizons but the the accu original accumulator is sharing the information publicly people react to it from work that we've done uh, in situations where we've either worked with the SEC or one of the um, regulatory agencies like FINRA, we are aware of situations where they're in a particular building or a particular zip code or something like that, there's a group of trading that all happens at the same time. And maybe it's just coincidence, maybe it's elevator talk, maybe it's something else. But that, that's the more worrisome situation for us where, you know, somebody shows up and says they've got a 5% holder and then the proxy solicitors dig in and in fact it's more like 12 or 13 or 15% and it just so happens they're all in one particular section of Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, sounds like you're hanging out with the <laughs> wrong people, but I haven't really seen that. But again, having said that, there are rules that could police that. Maybe they're not perfect. Maybe you think they have to be tightened. But again, my experience, I really haven't seen that enough to think that that's a real issue that justifies the level of talk we have about this. Now, Ellie and I always have a tradition and I'm oh, gonna continue it. So this year, it's a flying pig for you. A flying pig? Well, I, I can't put this on the back, back of my car like last year with the bumper <laughs> no, stickers. Um, that's nice, we make miracles happen. That is terrific. I have to tell you something, I was gonna get you something, but I was skiing and I was thinking, do I ski or do I get you a <laughs> present? So I'll just have to make that up to you afterwards. No, no need, no need. Thank you very much. <laughs>